Tanaka, you're watching Talk Business. And to all our viewers who are joining us from around the region via Sky Pacific, welcome to the show. This week on Talk Business. Cast iron stoves, are they the best alternative to the good old open fire stoves? Fiji's first cultural theme park opens its doors and the region's largest trade exposition gets underway. That's all coming up in the next half hour. For centuries now, cooking over an open fire has been part of our human civilization. Since men discovered the element of fire, most forms of cooking have taken place over a blaze. Over time, with innovation, this trend has changed to include the more modern alternatives. But despite this change, many still today opt for the good old open fire stove. And it's not just always about necessity. Unfortunately, the rising cost of kerosene and cooking gas has meant that many households have had to resort to the once early methods of cooking. Here at home, it's no different. According to the 2008-2009 Household Income and Expenditure Survey of the Fiji Bureau of Statistics, a whopping 77% of all rural households still cook with wood, more so the poorer families. Now, 17% of urban households were using wood for cooking. But while the low cost of stoves make it an attractive option, the health risks, on the other hand, are costly. Due to the open fire cooking, women and girls who mostly engage in the task are more susceptible to health risks associated with lungs, eyes, and even birth defects. The World Health Organization says every year, indoor air pollution is responsible for the death of 1.6 million people around the world. So what would fare as a viable alternative? Where households could use waste wood found in abundance here, yet use a cooking stove that was cheaper and not a health risk. This is where Professor Warren Narsi comes in. He realized that if rural people could cook on efficient wood stoves, not only would there be health benefits to women and girls, but in turn economic benefits to households as well. But to make simple smokeless stoves is hardly cheap. The professor then remembered the old cast iron stoves his mother used to cook on some 50 years ago. These stoves were far too expensive to manufacture locally and the overseas models were even more expensive for Fiji's households. After much search on the internet, he came across a relatively cheap model and manufacturer in China, a small town 200 kilometers south of Beijing. However, as good fortune would have it, the professor was invited with his wife to China to attend the Confucius Institute Directors Meeting. While there, Professor decided to pay a visit to the factory that manufactured the cast iron stove. And he was in for a surprise. My wife and I, we went to this factory with a, with a translator and it was as good as it looked, except that it wasn't a huge factory at all. You know, one of those mass producing, it was a small family run concern on the suburbs of a small town. And uh, the price was, you know, what they'd advertise and all that. So I thought, okay, it's worth experimenting with. He examined the stove that he was interested in and found it to be exactly what he wanted. So he bought four assembled units, one for himself, one for a friend, and two to interest the Ministry of Women and an NGO working with rural women. All three models were rather keenly taken over by his friends when he got back. So we decided to put the stove to the test. Just how efficient was this cast iron stove and could it be beneficial to our rural population? Because it's enclosed and the air supply is controlled, you, you use, tend to use less wood than you would in, in, a, in an open fire. Right? And the second thing is that we are now harvesting mahogany and all kinds of other timbers. A lot of the wood is left uh, to waste in the forest because people see, see no, no use for it. So my, my feeling is that if we can encourage people to, to use the waste wood you know, in cooking and all that, you're going to save on foreign exchange for kerosene and, and cooking gas. You're also going to be more efficient at using this wood. But the important thing is that you have a proper stove which has got a proper chimney where the smoke is, is, is all emitted away. You're going to have a healthy cooking environment for the people who are cooking with these stoves. 
Now, the stove can cook just about any dish that's on the menu for most Fijian households. For Mrs. Reddy, it's like reliving her childhood, growing up with an open fire stove, but this time round, without all the smoke. As the professor mentioned, one unit that's already assembled will cost just under a thousand dollars. That's hardly economical for a rural household or an average income earner. But if the Chinese government were to assist in form of a subsidy, then it would become viable. At the moment, it's costing about $900 to lend it in Suva, bringing it already assembled, which is more costly. Uh, I'm hoping that if it's brought disassembled, and if we can interest the Chinese government in it as a good development project to, to subsidize, you might be able to get these stoves in Fiji for maybe $400, $500, depending on how much uh, subsidy is given. So is this the better alternative? I think that if it lasts for longer than five years, and if you're able to get uh, this firewood for as cheaply as we're able to get it, you know, then I, I think it will be more economical than, than using kerosene and, and gas. Professor Narsi is hoping to get the relevant authorities on board the idea so women like Mrs. Reddy can still enjoy the outdoor cooking experience without all the unnecessary smoke. So I'm hoping to involve uh, and interest uh, NGOs in it, organizations like Friends, organizations like Songa Songa Vakamarama and others, people who want to foster development in rural areas and improve the standard of living for women. I think this uh, cheap cast iron stove can, can go a long way towards uh, doing that. Another It's a true celebration of culture and cuisine. In fact, Heritage Hamlet can be considered a cultural theme park of sorts. And the brainchild behind this concept is Subhash Chandra. He first decided to establish the outdoor theatre after a trip to India where he visited a similar cultural theme park. It was then when he realised Fiji could easily emulate the concept given our rich culture, traditions, song and dance. Especially we take our guests 30 to 50 years back and show them how we were living, uh, what we were eating, how we were entertaining ourselves, uh, how we were living in a communal environment and that has sort of changed in the last 50 years. Uh, so virtually we're sh showing our guests how we were living the two cultures together. If you look at Pacific Harbour Cultural Centre that was focusing on the Fijian culture in the Heritage Hamlet theme park, what we are doing is focusing on Fiji culture, so the Indian and the Fijian. Showcasing Fiji's cultures is a unique opportunity for visitors to soak in the experience and take a step back in time to colonial Fiji and to the days of the early settlers. It's about giving tourists an authentic Fijian experience beyond the sun, sea and sand that's become our trademark. I saw the theme park and within half an hour I just got in my mind that this will work in Fiji and Fiji really needed it. And then I compared that with uh, Bali, uh, Bangkok, Singapore. Uh, they're similar to Fiji in terms of tropical. They have white sand, blue sea. But they have an added advantage. They have the cultural part of it and that pulls a lot of tourists to that part of the world. And Fiji had it has this lovely white sand, blue sea, but they don't have, uh, the cultural part wasn't there. So I thought this will really work, and we're getting a lot of good vibes from our guests at the moment. 
But then again, there's no shortage of cultural experiences throughout the Pacific and Asia. So why would the concept of a cultural theme park work in Fiji? Uh, our research tells us that if a very tired executive leaves Australia, New Zealand or USA to come to Fiji, after three days they find that you know, they have nothing to do besides the white sand blue sea and they need something else and that's where we really fit in. Um, in terms of entertainment, and today the kids say the computer games is that that's the entertainment and we were boring. When we tell them what we used to do, the type of entertainment like marbles, people, uh, the kids hardly know what's marble, what's top, what's um, gulel, ceiling shot. And those things are quite, uh, our customers are quite intrigued to see that and they really enjoy and spend quite a bit of time on, on, uh, on things like that. And it's also about educational awareness on Fiji and what makes her special. It's very, very much, very much as uh, like any theme park around the world. In this one, everything when you pay a fee and get in, everything is included. All meals, as much as you want to eat throughout the day, all entertainment. So we have, uh, in terms of entertainment, we have the games. Then we have um, uh, the Bollywood, the Meke, uh, the, all the Fijian dance. So whatever you can see in Fiji, the Indian and Fijian. We have entertainment like that, we have some drama shows and then in the Fijian village we really uh, tell our guests what is a Yangona ceremony, what, who is a Matni Vanua, what is his responsibility, uh, how do you meet a chief, how the uh, ladies do their mat weaving, how uh, the wood carving is done, how lovo is done. So we, we show the entire Fijian culture in there and same as an Indian uh, village. We show how uh, uh, people were staying in a communal environment where uh, normally in, a, in the Indian house 30 years ago what we would find a cow, a goat, some chickens, the cow for their milk, the goat and chicken for their meat, and they'll have a vegetable garden uh, and virtually a kitchen outside. So we, we have set up uh, the, the Indian village like that, so to really portray how uh, the Indian community uh, used to live years ago and most of the places we're going to do is the same now but things have changed in the urban. Heritage Hamlet opened its doors in December last year and since then it's literally taken off the ground. With a two million dollar investment Chandra says they're here to stay and grow. Just similar to a day cruise so in a day cruise you go in uh, you spend the day you eat uh, have meals there so it's a similar thing you get in there you pay two hundred dollars um, that includes everything. You enjoy the day and come out and we have been, our, our guest has been very, very happy. The comments we have been getting is very, very positive. Those behind the business are looking to introduce water sports to the theme park, given the adjacent Nandi River and Billy Billy rides will be the main feature. And finally on the show tonight, the region's largest trade exhibition kicked off this week here in the capital city. Talk Business caught up with those behind the event to find out just what it's all about. It's an idea that uh, started way back in uh, 2011 uh, and uh, it was an idea that originated from um, UNDP, uh, Pacific Centre. Apparently in 2011 they had a bit of money uh, that was allocated for women in business in the Pacific. Uh, and so uh, UNDP uh, Pacific Center came to PIPSO uh, and asked the question, uh, what can they do with this money? Uh, and they expanded that question uh, to the, um, what the private sector can do in the Pacific mm -hmm. to promote its own products and to pro promote themselves. So um, the idea was conceived at the time uh, and so uh, a group of uh, stakeholders were put together uh, and um, organized the 2012 Trade Pacifica. We have created a couple of very uh, important themes uh, to, for the Trade Pacifica to project. Uh, for instance, women in business. Uh, if you look around the Pacific, uh, there is uh, 
women in business, a growing industry. Go to Samoa, going to, to some of the MSG countries, uh, it, it's a growth in industry in itself. So that's um, one aspect of trade uh, in the Pacific that we are promoting, uh, especially for Trade Pacifica. Uh, the other special theme is um, youth entrepreneurship. Uh, there's a lot of focus now on uh, educating the youth of today uh, to be better citizens of tomorrow, uh, to become business people themselves. Uh, and there are formal uh, educational programs that are being carried out at schools, uh, not only in primary and secondary schools, but also in some of the tertiary education. Uh, so we want to provide a focus uh, on youth entrepreneurship. So there will be a booth where uh, some of the um, young entrepreneurs already established in business uh, will be showcasing what they are uh, doing. We will be looking at 40, 40 to 50 uh, buyers and visitors uh, coming from within the region uh, and also from outside the region as far as uh, the Middle East for instance. So that is quite exciting uh, and so uh, in uh, Trade Pacific 2014 we want to take full advantage of that. So one of the, um, the features uh, on uh, every day uh, or part of the program uh, is to uh, organize bilateral consultations between the buyers uh, and the exporters. So there would be a lot of work required for that. We need to match up the interests uh, and we need to arrange for uh, discussions to take place. The bottom line is really to increase trade and, and we uh, achieved that in 2004-12 to some extent. Uh, How and, much are we looking at? Uh, it's very difficult to uh, assess the kind of uh, trade that will come out of this. Um, but um, looking back in 2012, uh, we had thousands of dollars uh, generated uh, just from 2012 alone. Um, you know, tens of thousands of uh, new new trade dollars uh, of new trade. So now, with a, a bigger trade Pacifica 2014, uh, we certainly hope that um, we will generate a lot of interests, new interests, new trade, uh, and new investment. Um, so, you know, I, I, I doubt whether we will get to the million dollar mark or half a million dollar mark, but uh, any increase from the 2004-12 achievement uh, would, would be very satisfactory for us. The important thing is the, the awareness uh, and the, the, the knowledge that will come out of, of this. Um, there will be a focus on women uh, in business. There will be focus on youth entrepreneurship. Uh, and so the knowledge of uh, youth entrepreneurship and what they can do uh, in the economy uh, is going to grow out of uh, Trade Pacific 2014. Uh, and um, the other awareness of um, the market and uh, the trade barriers and how to facilitate um, the role of um, the trade enablers. Uh, so all that will be very, very important uh, and will be a step forward from 2012. Uh, so we are certainly uh, hoping for big outcomes uh, out of 2014 Trade Pacifica. And that's all for this week. We'd love to hear from you, so do send us your emails, talkbusiness at fijitv.com.nj. Remember, you can catch me on the net on our YouTube channel, www.youtube.com slash talkbusiness or find us on Facebook, www.facebook.com slash talkbusiness. And if you have a Twitter account, follow me at Rachna Fiji TV. Thank you for joining us. Do join us again at the same time next week. Until then, have a productive week.